So uh, this year, uh, I am a season ticket holder for uh, basketball games at the University of Northern Iowa. Um, I'm very excited about that. Uh, last year, Jason Warren bought two tickets, and then he shared some of those games with me, and we convinced ourselves that the drive isn't that bad. So uh, this year, I went ahead and took the step of getting two tickets of my own. Wednesday, we made the trip. Uh, we went, went in the afternoon, got back just a little after midnight. Wasn't that bad. Team lost. That wasn't great. But um, altogether, it's a six-hour round trip for a two-hour basketball game. Uh, I'm going to go about a dozen times uh, in, in the middle of the winter, so we, we, we always risk um, sketchy weather, that sort of thing. So on Wednesday, I had quite a bit of windshield time to ponder why I'm doing this. Setting aside the fact that I'm probably a little bit crazy and care about sports way too much, and accepting the truth that while I would like to believe that my presence there helps the team play better, they're going to play the same whether I'm present or not, here's what I came up with. It's the difference between a box score and being there. It's the difference between reading about the game in a box score or actually witnessing it in person. You see, I could just wait until the morning after the game, and I could find the box score on the Internet or in the paper, and the box score will tell me everything I need to know about what happened in that game. It tells me who won, who lost, how many points each player scored, how many shots they took, how many shots they missed, how many rebounds they had, how many minutes they played. It will even tell me how many people were in attendance. You can get all the facts about the game from the box score. But the box score doesn't really allow you to experience the game. It doesn't help you get a feel for the atmosphere in the arena or see the hustle of a player diving on the floor. The box score doesn't help you see the coaching decision to call a timeout at a critical juncture or, or, or make a defensive change to slow down an opposing player. A box score gives you all the facts. But being at a game helps you experience it. And if you enjoy basketball like I do, that makes a huge difference. So that's the analogy I thought of as I was thinking about our passage for today. Today we're going to be looking at Job chapter 38 and 39, which is all about God's role as creator of the universe. And usually when we think about Bible passages that talk about creation, the first thing we think of is Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis 1 gives us the pertinent information. God said, let there be light, and there was light. It's a summary of facts. To me, Genesis 1 is the box score. Job 38 and 39 covers the same ground as Genesis 1. But it's about as different as being at a game is from reading the box score. Job 38 and 39 uses poetic language. It uses a series of rhetorical questions to get you to feel like you are present as God creates. Job 38 and 39 is about as close to being present for creation as the Bible can get us. More than simply saying God is the creator... My goal today is to help you to experience what that means. Before we get into the text, though, I need to say a little bit about the book of Job. Most of you know the story of Job. Horrible things happen to Job. Job loses his wealth, he loses his children, he loses his health. Job suffers a great deal. And most of the book is an extended conversation between Job and his friends who attempt to explain his suffering to him. They suggest some very reasonable understandings of God, and in every case, Job shoots their arguments down. In fact, Job is a very hard book to preach from, because there are many chapters in Job where it seems like some very wise descriptions of God are being given, only to find out at the end of the book that they're mistaken. Even some of Job's speeches, which sound so good, turn out to be subpar in their theology of God. The whole book comes to a crashing conclusion at the end when God speaks. God never does give an explanation for Job's suffering. But he does challenge Job's right to question him. Here's how Job 38 begins. 
Then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm, and he said, Who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man, and I will question you, and you shall answer me. And then God goes on to give a rousing description of himself that we'll look at in just a moment. But his message essentially boils down to this. Until you know a little bit more about running the physical universe, Job, don't tell me how to run the moral universe. In the end, Job ends up vindicated. Because even though he never finds out why he suffered, and even though some of his questions about God bordered on blasphemy, Job never gave up on God. And that seems to be the point. He, he hung in there. He kept his faith even in the midst of suffering, just as God predicted in the opening chapter he would do. The lesson of Job seems to be that we can endure suffering so long as we know that God is in control and continue to trust in him. As one commentator says, it gradually dawned on Job that without knowing why he was suffering, he could face it so long as he was assured that God was his friend. So that's the context for the passage we're going to be looking at today. Exodus, excuse me, Job 38 and 39 are a part of God's speech to Job. It's his poem about creation. The point is, the Lord of nature wants us to experience the wonder of his creation. It's not like reading a box score. God wants us to feel like we are there. So I've got a lot of ground to cover today. We're going to go through two whole chapters of the Bible. I'm going to divide it into three parts. First, God wants us to know that he's the Lord of the world below. Let's get into it. Job 38, starting in verse 4. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set? Or who laid its cornerstone while the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy? This whole passage is a series of rhetorical questions. Job and his friends have presumed to question God, so now God's going to question them. And the obvious implication is that there's a lot about creation we don't know the answer to. So here, God begins by picturing himself like a contractor. Think Brian Muggenberg or Craig Koonsman or Dustin Reynolds, down, down in a hole, down in a, a basement, laying concrete, uh, setting cinder blocks in place. Here's God laying the foundations of the earth. Only as you picture these contractors working, you need to picture like a choir of angels standing behind them, shouting for joy while they do the work. That's what happened when God laid the foundations for the world. Verse 8, God says, Who shut up the sea behind doors when it burst forth from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment and wrapped it in thick darkness, when I fixed limits for it, set its doors and bars in place, when I said, This far you may come and no further, here is where your proud waves halt. God goes from talking about the continents to talking about the oceans. And here he pictures himself swinging shut a door, putting bars in place, saying to the water, this far you may come and no farther. This summer when we were at Glacier National Park, each day when we left the park on our way back to where we were staying, I would pass signs that said, Hungry Horse Reservoir. And I'd never heard of Hungry Horse Reservoir before, but the signs were in brown, which means that they were a point of interest. So one day we left the park a little early, too early for supper, and I thought, well, let's go see what this thing is. So we followed the signs out into the forest and up the mountain. We sort of followed along the river until we came around a corner, and this is what we saw. Do we have the picture? That's the Hungry Horse Dam. I've been to Hoover Dam. Um, when I went to Hoover Dam, there were tour buses there. There were helicopter flights taking place. There were tourists all over the place. Um, this is not as tall as Hoover Dam, but it's twice as wide. There's as much concrete here as there is in the Hoover Dam. It took them five years to build this in the 1950s, uh, South Fork of the Black Fork River. Um, this is what human beings do to stop a river. And God says, the oceans, this far you may come. Stop 
right there. He swings the door shut. He puts the bars in place. And the waves go no farther. Verses 12 through 15. God says, have you ever given orders to the morning or shown the dawn its place, that it might take the earth by the edges and shake the wicked out of it? The earth takes shape like clay under a seal. Its features stands out like those of a garment. The wicked are denied their light, and their upraised arm is broken. Here God says that he orders the morning around like a drill sergeant. Calls roll in the morning, and the, the dawn reports. They, 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 they shake the blanket out. You know what this is? You take, you, you take a blanket and you shake it out so that you get the dust out of it. Well, he orders the dawn to shake out the wicked. The wicked operate under the cover of darkness, right? That's their light. That's what that's getting at. The wicked operate in the dark, but then the sun comes and it shakes them out. God orders the morning. Verse 16. Have you journeyed to the springs of the sea or walked into the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been shown to you? Have you seen the gates of the deepest darkness? Have you comprehended the vast expanses of the earth? Tell me if you know all this. What about the deepest parts of the ocean? Who's seen that? Actually, human beings have seen the deepest part of the ocean. We've, we've invented a bathyscaph, a deep sea submersible. It's a round sphere that holds two people. It's got five inch thick walls. It's got one tiny little window in it made out of a plexiglass cone. This thing can withstand pressures up to seven miles deep. They've dropped it to the bottom of the Marianas Trench, which we believe to be the deepest part of our ocean. Uh, and two guys in there with a little flickering light bulb have seen the bottom of the ocean. That's what it takes to keep them alive. God walks around down there like it's his backyard. The point, again, is that God knows everything there is to know about the construction of our planet. He set the continents on their foundation. He, he, he drew the boundary where the oceans would stop. He's intimate with the deepest shadows and the farthest reaches of the earth. But there's more. Not only is he the Lord of the world below, he's also the Lord of the world above. Verses 19 through 21. What is the way to the abode of light? Where does darkness reside? Can, can you take them to their places? Do you know the paths to their dwellings? Surely you know, for you are already born. You've lived so many years. God pitches the light living in a house. Right? When the day ends and, and night comes, where does the sun go? He, he pictures the sun going to a house. And then, and then day comes and he pictures the dark going to a house. I, I, picture, I picture the sun and moon dressed like 1950s businessmen living out in the suburbs. And every day at shift change, they pass each other on the street and they tip their cap to one another. Right? The sun clocks out for the day and he heads home and the moon, you know, morning you know, or, or evening or whatever. And, 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 and God knows where they live. God knows where they are. We don't see them. Now, we don't see the sun at night, but God does. Uh, scientists will explain to you, of course, it's the rotation of the earth, and it's the, it, it, it's the revolution around the sun, and we get all of that. But God sees it all. Verses 22 through 30. Have you entered the storehouses of the snow or seen the storehouses of hail, which I reserve for times of trouble, for days of war and battle? What is the way to the place where the lightning is dispersed, to the place where the east winds are scattered over the earth? Who cuts a channel for the torrents of rain and a path for the thunderstorm or water? To water a land where no one lives, an uninhabited desert, to satisfy a desolate wasteland and make it sprout with grass. Does the rain have a father? Who fathers the drops of dew? From whose womb comes the ice? Who gives birth to the frost from the heavens? When the waters become hard as stone, when the surface of the deep is frozen... What about the weather? God says he has storehouses of snow. He's got an armory of hail. He's just holding for special occasions. I mean, this probably isn't the greatest image for us to be looking at. You know, as winter approaches, they talk about it maybe snowing this week and that sort of thing. God's got whole storehouses of precipitation up there. 
He's like the Amazon.com of weather, right? He's got all these distribution warehouses, and he's got this perfect system for fulfilling orders that sends it exactly where he wants it, when he wants it there. Last week, I attempted to give a very simplified scientific explanation of how lightning is formed. It was very imprecise, dumbed-down explanation. But everything I looked at last week to get an explanation, to get that explanation, said that, for the most part, scientists are just guessing. Right? That is, they understand the basic mechanics of how lightning is formed, but thunderstorms operate on such a grand scale, and there are so many factors involved, that there's simply no way to fully understand how all the different parts work together. But God understands it. He's the father of the rain. Cast your eyes even higher. Verses 31 through 33. Can you bind the chains of the Pleiades? Can you loosen Orion's belt? Can you bring forth the constellations in their seasons or lead the bear out with its cubs? Do you know the laws of the heavens? Can you set up God's dominion over the earth? Ever since I was a kid and studied the constellations, there have been two constellations that I can reliably find. I can find the three stars that make up the belt of Orion's belt, and I can find the Little Dipper, Ursa Minor, the, the Little Bear, right? That's it. That's it. I can't, I can't find any of the other constellations. The rest are just dots in the sky to me. But God knows all the star maps. God knows where they all are, and not just the stars in our galaxy. He knows where all the stars in our galaxy in the 100 billion galaxies that scientists believe exist in our universe. Now let me repeat that. Let that blow your mind for a little bit. Scientists believe that there are at least 100 billion galaxies. Not 100 billion stars, 100 billion galaxies. Each galaxy containing untold numbers of stars. And our God knows where every one of them is. If that's not enough, or that's just too much to comprehend, come back down. We'll just talk about the rain again. Verses 34 and 38. Can you raise your voice to the clouds and cover yourself with a flood of water? Do you send the lightning bolts on their way? Do they report to you, here we are? Who gives the ibis wisdom? Who gives the rooster understanding? Who has the wisdom to count the clouds? Who can tip over the water jars of the heavens when the dust becomes hard and the clouds of earth stick together? God whistles, and lightning springs into action like well-trained hunting dogs. God counts the clouds like you and I count shirts in our closet. God tips over a drinking glass, and on earth a drought ends. John Piper writes, so whether we focus on the earth or the sea or the dawn or the snow or the hail or the constellations or rain, the upshot is that Job is ignorant and impotent. He doesn't know where they come from. He doesn't know how to make them work. He is utterly surrounded above and below by mysteries. And so are we. Because the scientific advancements of the last 200 years are like sand pails of salt water hauled from the ocean of God's wisdom and dumped in a hole on the beach while the tide is rising. God is not impressed. And we should be overwhelmed with our ignorance, not impressed by our knowledge. And if that isn't enough for you to feel the immensity of God's sovereignty over creation, let's take a walk through the animal kingdom. Because God is also the Lord of the world of animals. Verses 39 through 41. Do you hunt the prey of the lioness and satisfy the hunger of the lions when they crouch in their dens or lie in wait in the thicket? Who provides food for the raven when its young cry out to God and wander about for lack of food? The lioness prowls the savanna looking for prey for her pride. Baby ravens huddle in their nests, cry out for food. And where does it come from when they eat? Ultimately, it comes from God. He feeds the sparrow and the sloth, the needlefish and the narwhal. The entire food chain has been designed and linked together by God. Now chapter 39, starting verse 1. Do you know when the mountain goats give birth? 
Do you watch when the doe bears her fawn? Do you count the months till they bear? Do you know the time they give birth? They crouch down and bring forth their young. Their labor pains are ended. Their young thrive and grow strong in the wilds. They leave and do not return. Who is present at the birth of every single living creature on earth? God is. Mountain goats up in the mountains, deer up in the north woods. When the emperor penguin gives birth, right? You all saw the March of the Penguins. When the emperor penguin gives birth and then marches across the glacier to get food and bring it back, God sees that. When the little tiny poison arrow dart frog in the, the, the rainforest of the Amazon has its tadpoles and then puts each one on her back and climbs 100 feet up into the air to the top of the treetops, God sees that. When an elephant out in the middle of Africa calves, God's there. He knows their months. He cares for their young. He's present. Verses 5 through 8. Who let the wild donkey go free? Who untied its ropes? I gave it the wasteland as its home, the salt flats as its habitat. It laughs at the commotion in the town. It does not hear a driver's shout. It ranges the hills for its pasture. It searches for any green thing. There are wild animals out there. Animals that will never be domesticated, impossible to train. God understands them. He set them free. He gives them the wilderness for running. He gives them the hills for their pasture. Job didn't do that. We humans had nothing to do with that. But there they are. Verses 9 through 12. Will the wild ox consent to serve you? Will it stay by your manger at night? Can you hold it in the furrow with a harness? Will it till the valleys behind you? Will you rely on it for its great strength? Will you leave your heavy work to it? Can you trust it to haul in your grain and bring it to your threshing floor? There's this show on Iowa Public Television that Ellie likes to watch after school. It's called Wild Kratts. Anybody see this? I've seen a lot of Wild Kratts. Right? It's this combination live action animation show about these two brothers, Chris and Martin Pratt, or Kratt, Chris and Martin Kratt, who just get totally geeked out about animals. Right? Every show is about a different animal and its special adaptations and behaviors, and, and, and they call them creature powers. Right? So there's a show on cheetahs that talk about how fast they are. There's a show on the honey badger that talks about how tough he is. All these different creature powers. And here God comes and says he knows all about those creature powers. In fact, he designed them. He gave them to those animals. He sees them all. There's not an animal characteristic that is a surprise to God. Verses 13 through 18. The wings of the ostrich flap joyfully, though they cannot compare with the wings and feathers of the stork. She lays her eggs on the ground and lets them warm in the sand. Unmindful that a foot may crush them, that some wild animal may trample them. She treats her young harshly as if they were not hers. She cares not that her labor was in vain, for God did not endow her with wisdom or give her a share of good sense. And yet when she spreads her feathers to run, she laughs at horse and rider. Even strange animal behavior. Even the incongruity of a bird that has feathers but does not fly. Of an animal that lays its eggs and forgets where it put them. Even the strangeness of a bird that can run faster than a horse. God designed all of that. The foolish things in nature, the things that bug us, the the mosquitoes and the houseflies, they're all there by divine design. Verses 19 through 25, you give the horse its strength or clothe its neck with a flowing mane. Do you make it leap like a locust, like striking, striking terror with its proud snorting? It paws fiercely, rejoicing in its strength. It charges into the fray. It laughs at fear, afraid of nothing. It does not shy away from the sword. The quiver rattles against its side, along with the flashing spear and lance. In frenzied excitement, it eats up the ground. It cannot stand still when the trumpet sounds. At the blast of the trumpet, it snorts, aha. It catches the scent of battle from afar, the shout of commanders and the battle cry. Not all animals are foolish and useless. Some are incredibly helpful to human beings. Witness the horse, the war horse, an animal that lives for battle. Instead of shying away, it runs into it. 
Where does it get its strength? Where does it get its speed, its desire to obey? It all comes from God. Verses 26 through 30, does the hawk take flight by your wisdom and spread its wings toward the south? Does the eagle soar at your command and build its nest on high? It dwells on a cliff and stays there at night. A rocky crag is its stronghold from here. It looks for food. Its eyes detect it from afar. Its young ones feast on blood. And where the slain are, there it is. Whether we consider the prey of lions, the birth of mountain goats, the freedom of the wild donkey, the strength of the wild ox, the stupidity of the ostrich, the might of the war horse, or the flight of the hawk and the eagle, the upshot is the same. We are ignorant and impotent. We did not make them. We do not know how to control them. We cannot see what they are doing. And yet it's all a part of God's grand design for stitching our world together. Are you getting the picture? Are you being overwhelmed by the depth and variety and scope and distance and complexity of God's creation? Are you experiencing the wonder of what it means to say that the Lord created the heavens and the earth? And this is more than dry theology. This is more than a box score. This is just a brief moment inside the arena of nature that is far more amazing and incredible than anything we could even begin to fathom. Okay, that's Job 38 and 39. But now the question. What does any of this have to do with Christmas? I mean, why a sermon on creation the second week of Advent? I didn't talk about shepherds or wise men or stars in the east or any of that stuff. So how does this fit? Well, I'll tell you. Our theme verse for Advent this year is Colossians 2.9, which says, For in Christ all the fullness of the deity dwells in bodily form. Basically, that says that everything that God is, Jesus is. Everything that the Bible says is true of God is found in that baby born in Bethlehem. Every characteristic and attribute that's uniquely God, every superlative that sets him apart, every rhetorical question that can only be answered with God, that all describes Jesus. The fullness of deity dwells in him. And that means that Mary's son is the Lord of nature. That means the baby laid in a feeding trough for a cow was the one who actually designed that cow. And that's not just something I'm saying. That's what the Bible says. John 1, 1 through 3, the prologue of John's biography of Jesus says this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and through Him all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. The word here, that's Jesus. And John wants us to know that he was there in the beginning. He was with God. He was God. He was there with God in the beginning. And that means he was there for the creation. In fact, all things were made through him. Without him, nothing that was made could have been made. Because he's the agent of creation. And just in case we don't get it, skip down a few verses. John 1, verse 14. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. That's Christmas. The very word who was there for creation, the one who oversaw the foundation of the earth and the damming up of the oceans and the one who inventories the heavenly storehouses of snow and whistles for the lightning and watches over the labor of mountain goats and runs after ostriches and flies with eagles, that word became flesh and dwelt among us. You can draw a line directly from Job 38 to John 1. You draw a line from Genesis 1 to Luke 2. Jesus is the Lord of creation. He holds it all in his hands. There's no application for you this week. There's no 
steps for you to take or, or questions for you to ponder. I just want you to be overwhelmed by this amazing truth. I just want you to experience a little bit of what it means to say that Jesus is God. That the word became flesh. That the creator came to his own creation. Let's pray. But Father, as we just read these two chapters of Scripture and just sort of contemplate the mysteries of the known world, and think that you understand it all, you designed it all, you, you see it all, you're present everywhere, it is overwhelming. Lord, we are reminded of how small we are, how little we know. And then we take that a step further and we think that you, the one who created and governed it all, stepped into it as a tiny baby boy. That you took on flesh, that you dwelt among us in this world that you created. Lord, I, I'm guessing everybody here has heard that before. Just pray, Lord, that you'd help us to feel it. Help us to feel the weight of that truth. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Uh, so whatever image you like, the image of God as contractor laying the foundations of the earth, or the image of God setting a dam on the oceans, or the image of God tending to the warehouses of snow, or the image of God attending to the birth of wild donkeys, or, or, or whatever image you take home with you today, just remember that God is our Jesus, that that the God of creation became a part of creation. The word became flesh and he made his dwelling among us. As you go, may the Lord bless you, may the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Even so, Maranatha, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen.